Jim Gustafson, professor of psychiatry at the University of Wisconsin Medical School, giving my ninth in a series of 36 lectures every Friday, posted on YouTube by mid-afternoon, except for an occasional vacation, which I deserve. Earliest on YouTube on the Jim Gustafson channel, about four items down the, the list, or on my website. Now all, now we get down to the actual lecture. All of these lectures are actually translated from long, longer lectures that are in a book that Megan will have ready for me soon. Um, it's called uh, Positioning Opens and Closes the Lines of Sight. And it'll, we'll publish it in a few weeks. Um, its introduction to my work is on my website. Um, and uh, um, psychiatry.wisc.edu forward slash Gustafson. And what it says there is something that, that we'll come right down to right away, which is that every problem in psychiatry is a problem of positioning, purely and simply, geometrically, nonlinearly. Today's version of right and wrong positioning in Lecture 9 is called lightheartedness and heavyheartedness. Uh, with the help of Emily Dickinson, I'm going to prove to you today how these are profoundly matters of positioning. You can be in a lighthearted position, you can be in a heavy-hearted position, and, and it will pay out according to where you, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. It will flow from where you, how you start. Um, so let's start immediately with how Emily Dickinson um, states the problem with total precision in her poem 1343, which I'll recite to you. A single clover plank was all that saved the bee, a bee I personally knew from sinking in the sky. Twixt firmament above and firmament below, the billows of circumference were sweeping him away. You too. The idly swaying plank, it's very eerie, the idly swaying plank, responsible to naught. A sudden freight of wind assumed, and Bumblebee was not. This harrowing event, transpiring in the grass, did not so much as wring from him a wandering alas. I will refrain for the sake of brevity not to talk with you for several hours about this poem, but to say, to note that the wandering bee, the bottom line, if, if Neil were here, he would say, come on, what's the bottom line? Tell me what to do with this practically. Um, the bottom line is in the lesson that we're going to derive from this is that the wandering bee has taken a harrowing event in stride. What would, what would be very heavy has become a very light event for the bee. A bee I personally knew, says Emily, referring to herself. All that saved him from sinking in the sky and also from the billows of circumference sweeping him away. That's, a, that's, that's what happens to us. We all get decentered. The billows of circumference. We get, all get pulled out to the circumference, you see. All that saved him was a single blade of clover, and then a sudden freight of wind, and he's not. On wanders to be, not missing a step. Now that could be you, if, I, if you get this lesson today, you see. I will confess, uh, reading this poem for the first time, I did not want to depart from its, its aura, um, twixt firmament above and firmament below in such beautiful suspension. Uh, it's like a, in readiness for all the probable forces. It's, it's very much a Zen master would understand this. Exactly. That's what it means. You're on the, here's the uh, clover plank here, right? Only it has to be green. But you always have to be ready. <laughs> Afraid of wind and the, and the field has changed. All right, now for the second part of the lecture. Balancing on the bifurcation between history and the noble field, a single clover plank. 
Um, I had to, of course, after I was in this poem, I had to go back to the clinic where there were 15 or 20 patients drowning in history of their own, and uh, I have to get back and forth. Now, this takes a certain objectivity found in a few. Maybe more now that you've all heard this, will have heard this lecture, you see. Found in a few, uh, like Homer, you know, I'm sure you all aspire to be Homer. Right, Julie? <laughs> right. And Lewis Hyde, though, he's, he taught, Harvard, uh, taught at Harvard in how to, how to read. Anyway, this is what he said. Hyde said it very beautifully. He said, anything contained within a boundary must contain as well its own exhaustion. Pause. What we recognize, what we receive from nature or from the imagination comes to us from beyond our sphere of influence. The continued fertility of these things depends upon their remaining beyond us and not being drawn into the smaller ego. In other words, I would like to stay lighthearted in the playing field of Emily's poem, where harrowing events are taken lightly in a step to the air of the next blade, a marvelous unbounded field. I ride the blade or not when a sudden freight of wind assumes it. I do this all the time on the tennis court. I can be beautifully in, in balance, ready to step left or right, and suddenly be thrown off, and then I have to reset. So it's a continuous problem. Now, now uh, but most people I know uh, or see in the clinic put themselves back into these bounded compartments in which you do the same thing over and over again, and you, and you can only go one way. You can only get exhausted if you do that all the time. Whereas the other compartment gives you more and more energy the more you can be there. So here's a case, and this goes to the conclusion of the lecture, which is on time. I conclude with a relatively simple example of a closed or bounded system that has to run into exhaustion the way it's set up. You don't want to be in a, in a compartment that has only one way to go into exhaustion. She was in that position, and I want to illustrate how I accept her being there, but I don't accept it. This is the case uh, of a young woman I saw in my we made a DVD of it in my brief psychotherapy clinic. Essentially, what she and I found was that she had put months of work into a document for her research group, only to have the entire work torn to pieces, like that, in a, in a minute, at the last minute, by her superior. Simultaneously, her older brother had thrown, told her of being thrown back into their, their, their own bleak childhood, which took her back. The mother continuously induced guilt, and the father hid behind the newspaper, right? The unbearable weight of this history was that her brother, her only uh, dependable person in the family, had nearly killed himself many times and barely survived. In other words, she felt his pain as her own, and he was just telling her about it. So she, here she was, you know, drawn into a heavy-hearted uh, feeling. Having come to this disastrous position, I asked her for a dream, and I got two simple ones which make a remarkable pair and now you can look at the whiteboard here at, at uh, that, and I'll explain those uh, hieroglyphic symbols on the, on the board right now. In the first, she was delivering mail in, in her university department. Um, that's uh, the bottom part of the, of the um, diagram in, the, in a lighthearted mode, um, with her mother supposedly helping her. You see, that's, that, those are eyebrows and a nose looking at and that looking at herself facing her mother. And she says, she's only getting in the way. And she laughed out loud and just went about her business, right? It wasn't a big deal. This mother that had been such a heavy, 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 terrible burden for her, right? It almost killed her brother and whatever, all right? In the second pair of the dream um, is at the top, it's a pair of of noses facing each other, nose to nose with a pair of eyebrows. Um, she's face to face with her mother, telling her how angry she is with her, which is good and bad. Good that she might stop her mother doing, making her feel guilty, maybe. But it's bad, because she feels terrible hurting her mother. 
So the very thing that seems to save her from her mother because she knows how wounded her mother was by her own mother, so she ends up, and so that red line indicates she just, it's, it's, a, it's a line straight into hell, into heavy heartedness, when she starts to attack, getting back at her mother, who hurt her so much. All right, uh, Ed, you can come back here. I'll take a little water and we'll finish the lecture and then we'll talk about it. I told our patient her pair of dreams was perfect for posing the position which is unbear unbearably heavy, the second dream, versus the position which is comic and lighthearted. In the second dream, she keeps the guilt going. Four worse, far worse. In the first dream, she is objective and comical and lighthearted, and it just takes her one step to the left, and she's it's like it's like a basketball move. In one step, she's right by right by her mother. Right, I used to do that all the time. I still do. Michael Ballant um, called the second position, the, that is the heavy-hearted position, he called it the depressive position with very precise meaning, which I'll tell you, and then we'll be done. It consists of having to have the supervisor, the mother, the brother, uh, the single clover plank, if you will, be what one wants it to be, which is to be reliable and right there and helpful, right? Everyone wants that. But if you have to have that, you're not ready for how every, a sudden freight of wind and assumes what was yours and it's not there. So you get out of the depressive, so you get very heavy hearted once your sphere of influence is that you're trying to control things that can't be controlled. It's impossible. Her mother, her brother, her supervisor, right? And everyone you know, whoever you're married to, if you are. It's impossible and bound to fail to try to control people to stand still because it would suit you. The first position gets free of such heaviness. A single clover plank becomes just what it is, a plank not to be walked for long. It gives what it has to give, after all, before the wind takes it away. It was all that saved the bee, yet responsible to nod, and a sudden freight of wind assumed it. How, here our, how our patient laughs aloud when she says, her mother's just getting in the way in the mail room. She becomes lighthearted, just goes around her. Thank you. <laughs>